I will be your MC or host for the rest of the morning. I hope everybody has enough coffee. Um, and I'm going to bring up our fearless leader, Chip, who will be moderating our next panel. All you conservatives and all you want to be conservatives out there, you know, don't forget that, uh, you know, in the spirit of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, the great Republican president of uh, the mid last century, uh, 1900. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's the one who put conservation in the conservative. And I think that it's really important that we all embrace our conservative values and remember <clears throat> that conservation is the root of that word. And to conserve and to be wise stewards of our planet. So, um, in that light, I'd like to welcome our next panel uh, that is uh, a, quite a an incredible collection of folks, and I think I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves as we go down the line and, and say who they are, what they do, and, and what their affiliation is. But, but just note that the built environment, which houses uh, all of us, <laughs> most of us, but that the urban areas uh, represent 75% of humanity lives in, in cities, and that those cities produce 75% of the carbon throughput into the atmosphere. So unless we get the built environment right, we're not going to fix this problem. And so that has to do with how do we heat and cool our buildings? And how do we manufacture the materials <clears throat> that go into the construction? And how do we calculate our trips to and from in our vehicles? And how much carbon throughput does that in fact produce and into the atmosphere? So we're going to be talking about that for the next 45 minutes. And I'd like to start uh, just right here with uh, Kevin. And if you could introduce yourself and um, just give us a quick snapshot of uh, who you are, what you do, and then we'll just go right on down the line. Thank you, Chip. Uh, my name's Kevin Carrier. I am the president and CEO of Powertron Global. Uh, Powertron started out as a nanotechnology company. Um, the goal of our original company, of our original offering, was to develop uh, a nano solution to restore efficiency in climate control systems. So many people do not know that all HVAC degrades uh, up to 30% of its original efficiency over the first four or five years of its life. And then it may uh, be operated uh, in, in service life for another 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so we started off uh, with the goal to uh, overcome that issue. We, we, we were successful, and then we met massive resistance to our technology. Um, we had to become a data company, uh, and we'll talk about our agreement on the panel about how data is, is really going to be the, the thing that drives change and that creates behavioral change uh, in the built environment. And so now our company has launched an IoT division where we can quantify uh, with certainty the, the improvements we can make and therefore uh, get professional engineers behind us and financing people behind us. And that, so that's what we do. Great, thank you. So uh, Jean Grobler, you're a, a good friend of mine. You live in Carbondale, I uh, where I live. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your company, FridgeWise? Sure. Um, one of the founders of a company called FridgeWise Inc. And what we've done is developed a line of products that go into HVAC that save energy. Uh, we spent the majority of the last six years really quantifying and monetizing uh, differentials of what you can put into an HVAC system to upgrade it from an energy efficiency standpoint. And it's been you know, a, a remarkable journey as we've sort of discovered uh, newer verticals and really sort of been focused on solutions uh, for HVAC that can really make an impact and save really a large amount of energy. So you know, our clients are, are big commercial clients and anybody that has an HVAC system. I think some of the things we're going to talk about today is you know, what, are, what are some of the solutions that we can offer the, um, the commercial component of any industry that has an HVAC system to really make an impact and, uh, and reduce the amount of energy that they're using in a number of different facets. And how do you monetize that? How do you create an ROI for someone that's going to do um, a retrofit and, and explore this massive retrofit opportunity that we've really sort of just stumbled into um, upon researching what the differentiators are and, uh, and trying to quantify that and monetize it. Great, thank you. And uh, Harry Teague, uh, you're uh, somewhat of an um, architectural superstar here in the Valley. 
Um, Harry's had some amazing accomplishments, including the music tent that we all enjoy to listen to the classical, world-class music every summer. Harry, can you talk a little bit about what you do and, and how that relates to um, uh, energy efficiency in the built environment? Well, um, I've been uh, making buildings in this uh, valley for almost 50 years now. And I began my career at the beginning of an awareness of the need of buildings to have uh, energy efficiency. And my, my first project, my thesis in, out of coming out of college was a school locally. And we had applied Thomason collectors. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember what a Thomason collector is, but it's a piece of wrinkly tin that water dribbles down and gets warm in the sun and has a piece of glass over the top. And that was our original uh, attempt at uh, collecting uh, energy from the sun. And uh, we have been continuing to refine uh, our approach to uh, making buildings uh, sustainable and uh, energy efficient ever since. Um, I represent the, perhaps in this group, the where the rubber meets the road uh, part of the of the equation in that we deal with the actual physical nature of things, our climate and so on, uh, in a very tangible way. And uh, I guess it's maybe more like where the hammer meets the nail, if we still use hammers and nails. But um, anyway, uh, we have uh, developed a very practical and common sense approach to uh, th this problem. And, and I think that, that that gives us insight, like anything. You look at the microcosm, and I think it gives you insight about the, the big picture, the macro picture. So uh, that's what we have to Great. contribute here. <clears throat> Thank you, and we'll dig into that a little bit later. Um, so um, the next man here, if you would introduce yourself. Jim Kehoe, I'm design leader at Charles Conniff Architects here in Aspen, Colorado. We, and, go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we do a lot of single family homes, very high end, but we also do a lot of municipality work. Uh, housing, developing projects within mountain communities. And it's really important we start these projects with a charrette. And I think that's an element that you can really strongly bring to the table these renewable energy options. Excuse me, is, now, is a charrette like a croissant? I mean, <laughs> it's a French word. It's, it's really, uh, it's, it's getting people around a table with croissants, so, so coffee. So, but, uh, <laughs> please define charrette. What is that process? It's basically um, a coming together of all the parties and stakeholders in a project before you put pen to paper and getting everybody's thoughts, constraints, opportunities on the table. And there's the ability to create innovation with that social innovation. We, we open these up often to public uh, or stakeholders within the public. And it's a, it's a really good way to start driving a project with uh, key features that will affect our environment. And one aspect of that that we've been looking at a lot lately is how can nature and what nature does to our biology and our cognitive health influence and be another player in instigating better environments for health and well-being. And that is a component of green building and sustainability. And it has a direct connection to um, our health and well-being. So would you say that during these charrettes that you know you see around the table with the owner and the architect and all the various other influencers and then the nature has a chair at that table? Yeah. It does. I mean it's 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 a nature is biophilia is a is a term used often that uh, incorporates nature into building. And I think that's a component that's not talked about that could add uh, feet to this dialogue about sustainability. Um, it, it helps with uh, the uh, uh, cutting down heat from asphalt and concrete and roofs and so forth, but then it has a, a very uh, important, 
uh, element to our health and well-being. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and finally, um, if you would introduce yourself. Sure. Charles Seifert. I am uh, Chief Technology Officer for FridgeWise, who uh, Jean introduced himself earlier. It's my boss down the way there. Uh, I've had a 10 plus year career in uh, the electric motor uh, world, worked for manufacturing. I've also worked for distribution. And really, I think my role on the panel here today is to talk specifically about um, you know, introducing new technology to quite frankly, a, a, a very old world. Um, you know, we speak about where the rubber meets the road and how do we actually impact and take power off the grid and, and tie that back to, you know, uh, where we all know the impact is, is that on the emission side. And what are the roadblocks and, and challenges in applying a new and great technology to a very old built environment? And um, these things are, are, are great machines and are capable of doing a lot of things in both the way of comfort and efficiency, but you have to be able to adopt that to the built world. Um, it, it, without that, you're not gonna really uh, have much impact, or you're gonna be waiting a long time for that. And uh, some of the things we were talking about this morning just on the way here is the time for action is now. You know, We really have no time to wait on, uh, on driving our impact through, and uh, for us that means re retrofitting the built environment. Great, thank you. Well, just to dive right in here, um, <clears throat> you know, it's my understanding that we're on the or magnitude of something in America of 120 million private homes, about 160 billion square feet of commercial real estate. I might be off on my numbers somewhat, but it, you get the picture. Now, every Amory Lovins down the street at RMI has told me that, you know, these buildings are either torn down and rebuilt or retrofit. Um, once every 25 years, 20, 25 years. And so in that, uh, we need to look at the fact that, um, <clears throat> you know, according to how you calculate it, if the built environment is, in fact, directly connected to 70 to 80 percent of all the greenhouse gas throughput, um, we better really take a, take a very serious Swing at this. So let's just start with one uh, Grobler here with FridgeWise. Now, I understand that you have a breakthrough technology. It's in the rooftop uh, HVAC systems, uh, any of the rooftop uh, systems that have fans and these blades that you guys manufacture take a steel fan blade and turn it into a carbon fan yep. blade. And in that, you receive an incredible efficiency gain. Yeah, um, that's one of the verticals that we've really sort of looked at <clears throat> exploring because there's such a big impact that one can make um, in that vertical, meaning rooftop units. I mean, every, every place you pretty much go into has a rooftop unit. And how do we make those rooftop units more efficient? Um, one of the things that we've, um, we've done is designed fan blades and built them out of carbon. So, you know, we've got various applications that you can put those fan blades into, and we're always talking about what we're going to do with all this carbon that we take out of the atmosphere. What can we do with it? What, what use can we have for that? And um, what we found is that carbon is a very um, interesting, you know, substance that is lighter, stronger, and can be formed in a, in a, in a perfectly balanced way to, to create a fan blade, right? So fan blades that we're looking at, um, are from 10 inches in a commercial refrigeration application all the way up to 13 feet in the oil and gas um, application where you, you're literally taking off a part that weighs 300 pounds and replacing it with a part that weighs 100 pounds. Um, you're building it out of carbon, you're setting it into an optimal balanced position, um, and you've just got a lighter, stronger part that's more energy efficient. So certainly in the, in the RTU space, and Charles, you can, you can uh, elaborate a little bit more about the package that we have in the RTUs and then tie it into what, you know, what Kevin does. There's a tremendous opportunity here to focus on a, on a solution to make a really large impact as far as uh, energy reduction goes and then actually being able to quantify that and monetize it. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these clients are looking for an ROI. They're looking for how quickly am I going to pay back my investment and... Um, you know, what's the biggest bang for my buck as far as putting in or implementing a solution that can really create an impact and make mm. an impact? Well, just so the audience understands, um, you know, what we're talking about here is skyscrapers in New York City that when you take these kinds of efficiency measures, the owners of these buildings are now receiving something on the magnitude of, what, 30 to 50% savings on their, on their energy bills, right? 
Yeah, so Charles, do you want to sure. just give us the range of what we're looking at there from a savings standpoint? Sure. Yeah, I, I don't want to lose the crowd too much on, on exact specifics of what we're doing. But you know, what I maybe would ask people to think about is, you know, the goal here is to make the biggest impact to the most number of people in the fastest way possible. And so for the, the path that we have taken with that is in retrofitting the built environment. And uh, there's a lot of things you can do there. You know, obviously, uh, I'm sure everybody in the audience is familiar with lighting retrofits and um, upgrading your, your uh, fluorescence to LEDs and the, the energy that you can take out by doing that. There's a, a, a hidden world uh, in buildings that uh, heating and air conditioning that help us all feel comfortable every day, move our air, uh, ventilate buildings, exhaust buildings, and, and help us feel comfortable uh, that I'm sure our, our architecture friends on the panel here can speak about. That's tremendously important. You don't want to be in a building that doesn't have that. Everything that is involved in that system, anywhere humans exist, there is going to be air or water being moved. And every time that happens, an electric motor is involved. So there are many, many of these things out there. And uh, the life of an average piece of equipment is 20 to 30 years. And just like any technology, the efficiency goes up over those years. So if you're now operating your built environment with equipment that was designed in you know, the late 70s, early 80s, and is now 10, 20% less efficient than the new things coming out of the factory today, it's important to be able to apply those. And what we've chosen to do as a company is to pick a few specific <coughs> opportunities that we see there's many, many units out in the built environment that we can go attack in and retrofit. And specifically what Chip was talking about is, is a rooftop unit. And uh, these are things that you just can't unsee once you finally see them. Uh, I challenge every one of you, when you take off in a plane the next time, you look out at that sea of buildings and you'll see almost every rooftop that's a single story building has more than one RTU on it. And there's a lot of kilowatts that go into those. Right. So. Rooftop units. Well, um, now over to Kevin here for a second before we get down to where the rubber meets the road and the architecture. Um, you know, Kevin, I met you in the uh, offices of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, one uh, was, uh, you know, uh, kind enough to bring me in there, and, and um, it was an extraordinary meeting to realize that Jerry Jones and his organization was very seriously looking at this very conversation. In fact, I think they started a company along those lines. So tell us about um, how Powertron factors in here and, and what you all are doing down there in Dallas. Okay, sure. So. Um, many of you may know that um, Jerry Jones owns the Dallas Cowboys and he built one of the most magnificent stadiums um, in existence, the sports arenas. And that stadium is an extreme example of the use of climate control systems. Um, it has to be able to uh, sustain a massive influx of heat from 100,000 plus people coming into the building. If they don't condition it, it'll, the space is so big it will create a climate of its own and it will actually rain in the system and it's in Dallas, Texas, so they have to condition it. The uh, architects that built the, uh, the, 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 the building estimated that it was gonna take in excess of a million dollars per month to condition the space. So Jerry, being the entrepreneur uh, that he is, said, well, how much is it gonna cost me to start a power company? And in Texas, power is deregulated. So he started, he spent uh, several million dollars starting his own power company so that he could cut his bill by the power at a lower cost. And he did that. And, and after that point, he said, well, we now have a power company. Let's go out and do this for other customers. He now has 1,200 customers. And as a way to reduce the total cost of procuring energy to his customers, in addition to bringing the cost down, they had an idea, and John Hickman, who we all met, uh, who's one of their business development people, said, why don't we help our new customers reduce consumption, right? Very radical from the power standpoint. Um, an opportunity they could take advantage of because they were new in the space and said, well, it doesn't matter if I go um, acquire a new customer and I help them use 80% less, I mean 20% less power than they were before, I still get a customer and it's all, it's all new business to me. And so we came in, uh, when we met them, they uh, contacted our company to be one of the solutions they put forward to their customers and thought that it would be a great case study to see what we could do into their facilities. So the, the Cowboy Stadium has 7,000 tons of refrigeration and we did an analysis for them and after five years of operation, that 7,000 tons was actually only producing 5,000 tons. 
uh, due to efficiency loss, just native efficiency loss. And, and that became an eye-opening uh, situation. So we came in with our technology to restore the, the, those tons and to allow the systems to run less. So what happens is if you have, let's just use round numbers, if you have 100 tons uh, that, that were designed from the beginning per whatever the building code is, and five years later, that 100 tons can only produce 80 tons, you're, you're effectively out of building code, and now that system has to run longer to handle the 100 ton load. And when that happens, your consumption uh, is driven up. So we came in, we solved that problem for the Cowboys, dropped their power consumption to what it was when the system was new, and that's how, that's how we got started with the Cowboys. So Great. Well, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing, and it goes to show you how uh, <clears throat> big league sports is taking this very seriously, and I know that, you know, <laughs> well, you know, if you're in the sports world, you're competitive, and so when I was down there, I threw out that the Philadelphia Eagles were the greenest stadium in the country, <laughs> and it's like, you know, I know that that reverberated, so, you know, there, I know that the Cowboys are coming back and, and really looking at how they can, especially because, um, you know, Mr. Jones has this company that's uh, operational in the sector. So, um, and we'll come back to this, but I want to jump over to Harry for a second because, you know, you've, you've also been working on some pretty large scale projects, and I know that in the design build, uh, you have to take these, <clears throat> these factors into consideration. So, um, you know, perhaps even though both of you architects uh, on the panel mostly focus in the residential sector, um, can, you, can you compare and contrast how that residence makes a difference in the commercial sectors? Yeah, uh, we, we actually, yeah, that's a small part of our business, but uh, we do a lot of institutional work and commercial work, but um, I, I would say that our, uh, it's emerged that, that technology has advanced a lot. We, we've heard some really brilliant, I think, ideas, and, and that gets self-motivated, that gets motivated by the, you know, the instant uh, sort of uh, apparent uh, advantage financially of making these moves and, and, and doing, you, you know, using lighter fan blades. It has a numerical value. What I've found is that, that our, our problem isn't so much uh, applying the technology, it's, it's and, and this emerged in the previous panel, which is talking the language and, and presenting what we're trying to do to uh, the clients who are going to build this uh, building uh, in, in a way that they can see clearly the advantage of what we're going to do. And what I would say is that that part of the equation is the one that has maybe moved the least effectively. That right now our tools for doing that uh, we, we, we just did a small building for, um, this is anecdotal, but in a very small building, but I think it's, a, it's, it's uh, I think, uh, relates to the larger picture. But we had a, a, a small building for a, a conservancy, and we had came up with a design strategy for shielding the building with screens around the outside to prevent uh, the, the, the heat from the sun and so on to reach the windows and the outside. It's a semi-transparent screen. And um, we, uh, we it, it cost a certain amount to do this. But by doing this, what we, uh, our theory was that we were going to be able to eliminate air conditioning entirely for the building. In, a, in this climate, we felt that the, this was completely possible to do. So we're not just making all these fans more efficient, we're eliminating the ducts, the fans, the power to run them continuously, the whole deal, and then converting this building to a natural organism, as you were talking about, right? And, uh, but we needed what, and this is the part that I'm getting to, what we really needed was a very sophisticated thermal model in order to predict the performance of this building so that we did continue to provide a, 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 an environment built environment that was acceptable uh, to work in and so on. And uh, so we went, there is thermal dynamic uh, modeling that, that's gotten quite sophisticated, but it requires lots of equipment and it's very expensive to do. So I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm imploring and, and so on, that the equations that go are, are to make a building, it's very, very complicated. There, there are all sorts of systems that apply materials skins, 
relationships of skins, the, 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 the environmental uh, effects of making those, manufacturing those skins, transporting to the building, things like uh, the LEED uh, certification and so on, tries to evaluate that, but the equation is immensely complicated. What I think we need at this point is, and this would be, it seems like other, other uh, human endeavors have uh, great software uh, to actually deal with all this, but to have a one piece uh, place to go to plug in all the variables that we have, predict the, the performance of the building, convince a client that, in fact, yes, this is going to cost 30000 more to do X, but that's going to save 60000 in the first five years, or whatever the answer is. Convert that to, uh, in financial terms, back to the client so they can clearly see the advantage because ultimately financial uh, return is going to be the thing that is most convincing at right. this point. So a lot of people are motivated by altruistic motives, but... But right. Well, you know, um, that's what I'm suggesting anyway, is that we could develop that piece of our puzzle. That seems to be what's missing. Right. Technology is moving along wonderfully. That that part of, uh, of our of right. process is what's. Well, at REI, you know, we we believe in less is more. Right. And, uh, you know, obviously efficient now. And I hear what you're saying. And if you were any of you that were here last night for the blockchain conversation, might be thinking, well, what Terry's talking about is exactly what they were talking about in terms of the digitization of currency and being able to micromanage every single thing going forward. However, right now we're presented with a, with a world that's built on technologies mm -hmm. that um, have not incorporated this kind of thinking, 99%, and that have to be dealt with in terms of how we actually operate them. So. Um, you know, to that point of the fridge-wise model, because I've been talking with uh, Jean and Kevin here about how do we deal with these urban environments that house the mass of, of humanity, and how do we retrofit them now in time to make a difference on the amount of carbon that we put up in the atmosphere every year, which is on the magnitude order of something like 40 billion tons on top of last year's contribution. And this stuff is up there for 100 years. But Chip, there are, two, there are two parts of that equation. One is technically, how do we do it? And we had some, I think, really interesting answers. You know, there, And I think that's happening all the time. And the profit in that is evident. The, 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 where the profit is not evident is to the person who has the beat up old building, what is their incentive to go and go through this process of retrofitting with these vans, cleaning up their equipment and so on? I mean, that has to be demonstrated in a way that is convincing. And what I'm saying is that right now, the, to go through that, it's not an elevator conversation with a client. You can't say you're going to save you know, $50,000 right now, here, how, because it, the, the information has to come from a multiple, uh, you know, a really difficult m equation with lots of variables. And I think that's what, <clears throat> what is missing for, for the architects who, who really, we don't actually get to make the decisions. We, get, we have to present to our clients, here's our budget, here's why we're spending money on X. And, it, and if we can go immediately and move the, the you know, toggle the, the, the variables back and forth into a position where they say, okay, that's, that's good, then we're gonna go with that building. That's gonna convince people to retrofit buildings it's going to convince people to build new buildings more efficiently. I think and I'm not a money person. I mean, I'm, I'm motivated by passion about the environment. But that's I think what you're well, talking Kevin, about, Harry, you respond to that. Yeah. Well, I do. And, I, and, Thanks, I, and, and our company uh, really was, um, I would say, the victim of, of the resistance due to not having that data. So uh, Harry's right. And, and if you notice, everything's going to data. And so. Our company, and I, we'll talk, I'm gonna, we're going to go through the slides here in just a second, but our company became handcuffed by not being able to provide that data, so we had to go out and develop it. Um, many of you may have heard the term IoT. It stands for Internet of Things. Uh, Harry mentions all of the variables. And in a climate control model, it is very difficult, or it was previously very difficult, to act accurately 
um, measure the thermal side, which we all can't see, and it's, it's not lights. Lights are very easy. They come on, they use a certain amount of power, they turn off, you can quantify that very easily. In a, in a climate control world, everything that they design, the building envelope, the windows, the ther being able to create a climate and maintain it, every time you open the door, thermal energy moves in and out. That's very difficult to do, so we came up with a, our own proprietary way, uh, paint, very painfully so, and, and used an Internet of Things model, meaning we can come in and take a, a system that is old and designed back in the 80s, which they're still manufacturing today, and we can bring it online, and we can see inside of it with the precision of an MRI machine. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't exist in the, in the natural uh, markets. And so if now that we can do that, and one of the things I asked Harry last night is, hey, how, can you give me the data that you want to model that thermal, uh, that thermal map? so you can predict how much air conditioning you can eliminate from the, from the picture. And maybe that's something that we work together on. Um, but one of the things that, that, that I would like to really sort of bring it home is we, 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 we all know that, that, that financial drivers are the resistance. When you come in with a disruptive technology, a disruptive concept of sort of overcoming climate change, you have to, you have to disrupt money. Existing markets that are, are, are in place, people have fortified their path to money continually flowing. And in this model that we're looking at here, um, we think that the opportunity is in between the existing segments. So when we find uh, opportunities in buildings with our engineers, we first start with the architecture and design. And we also find that most of the awesome uh, ideas that are presented get cut at financing. Right? That's the part. They hit yeah. the cutting room floor. Well, money makes the world go round. And, uh, you know, so I'd like to do the rapid fire response to so the, the, the issue that Harry threw on the table here and just go down the line. And then I want to get to your, for the sake of time management, I want to get through your slides and then we'll just wrap it up. And I'd like to try to save a couple of minutes at the end, if we can, for the audience yeah. to uh, interact. Sure. So um, I think, Chip, you, a lot of it comes down to education, to what Harry's talking about. You know, people have got to understand what the opportunity really is. You know, there, there some, a lot of clients that we come across, even facilities guys, have no idea what, what technologies they've got running in their building and what they can improve on from an energy efficiency standpoint. So what we've tried to do is simplify that process and go and say, okay, this is what you've got in this building, this is what we can improve on. And look, in, in North America, we've got $350 billion worth of opportunity um, to actually go and retrofit. And a lot of that will pay back in less than two years. So a lot of this stuff should be standardized in all these older buildings, right? I mean, we've got all this opportunity to go and save a ton of power and a ton of electricity to the point where you could be even shutting down nuclear power stations if it was adopted, but people just don't actually know about it, right? Universities, hotels, anyone that's got an HVAC system um, can, can be improved upon as far as an efficiency play goes. Okay, and Jim, you want to respond? Yeah, I'm impressed with what Kevin and his team is doing. Um, uh, just one, it, it does come down to dollars. Um, we've been involved with retrofitting all the stock of affordable housing for Snowmass in the past six years, and we've renovated about 10 buildings uh, housing a lot of affordable folks. And what we found out, we went to the table, this charrette kind of concept, with the data, uh, we had a building energy analysis and photographs of infrared heat coming out, and where is the where are the leaks happening? And the town of Snowmass found out that if they retrofitted, they would be uh, gaining grant money from the state as well. So all that stuff came and was coalesced together, and we retrofitted those buildings and um, with new windows, exterior insulation. These buildings were built in the 80s and earlier. And uh, the end game was that they were saving, they're, they're paying the bills because this is all rental property. They're saving lots of money every year and the people are more comfortable. I had somebody come up to me at a bar and said, Jim, wow, you really m did an amazing job. We, it's, it's December and we haven't even turned the heat on yet. But part and parcel with you know, getting the skin of the building to be more energy efficient is to create a better uh, circulation system as well 
for uh, ventilation because you, you can't, you'll have sick building if you seal it up too much. Um, another, uh, uh, on the other side of the coin, I had a municipal client that threw out a geothermal loop system at the end of DD because their budget just wasn't lining up and that, uh, that system would have essentially paid for itself in 12 years. It's a 50 year building. But the bottom line was not coming together and they threw it out. Single family homes are putting in more geothermal loop systems than our municipal clients right now, which is a really good thing. Great, okay, so for the sake of our time budget, because we're running out there too, I wanna go right to Kevin's uh, yeah, uh, we'll slides and, and, and let's just go through that. So really quickly, and, and we have sort of a few slides for all of us, just, just some facts. 80% of the energy consumption of buildings is lighting and HVAC. Um, HVAC counts for 40 to 60% of that. In most cases, there are exceptions, but that, um, that is the number. And here's a staggering statistic, 70%, I got this from NREL, 70% of all HVAC in the U.S. is running 35 to 50% off design. What does that really mean? Well, they're using 35 to 50% more energy than they're supposed to. Um, what that translates into off of the total consumption of your bill, if half of your bill is, is comprised of, of climate control and it's 50% off, 25% of your bill is complete waste, unnecessary waste. Um, we all know about LED lighting, it's up to 70% more, more efficient. And where FridgeWise comes in, most mechanical systems in service are, they're the lowest rated efficiency because the industry has sold itself out, out to the lowest cost bidder. And when architects, and, I, and I'm, I'm a big fan of architects because they often spec the things that we want in buildings and they never get there because they, you know, the budget does. We need a new water fountain um, in the building. So, uh, th these are some of these nasty, scary mechanical systems that we all rely on and we complain about when we're hot or cold, but we don't know uh, really what goes on. These systems are what, where, where we work. Um, they're, they're, they're ugly, they're, uh, they're inefficient, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, talked a little bit about how, and what we all agree with, data is going to drive behavioral change. You have to have the data to sustain the financial backing so that the people can make a financial decision on energy efficiency projects. And that's how we can make an effect today. As Harry said, if he had the model that he needed, he can now go to the new building owner and justify financially his position, right? So uh, big data models, and we now have artificial intelligence. We now have systems that, uh, and our system included, where you can now predict when things run off their efficiency and proactively change them before they break, right? Um, I'll, and I'll let uh, Charles and Arjan talk about this. These are some of the opportunities. They mentioned electric motors are in, in all these buildings. These are some of the opportunities uh, that, that you have for efficiency. If you look at a building, this is an enormous uh, opportunity. And then the next slide, we'll show, I'm, I, I grabbed your, you can talk about the actual results. We'll show that too, so. Yeah, I think, I think you know, a lot of this stuff is out of sight, out of mind. And we're trying to make an impact here on things that we can actually physically go and take out and put in something that's more efficient. So I think of taking out a light bulb that's 100 watts, putting in a light bulb that's 20 watts. What we're doing here is doing the same thing in motors. All these buildings have a tremendous amount of inefficient motors running out of sight, out of mind that people have no idea about, right? So what we've done is specifically focused in on, on what that opportunity is, how to measure it, how to quantify it. And someone like a Morgan Stanley, for instance, could have you know, a million dollars worth of motors in one building. Um, someone like a Con Edison can come and give them an incentive of $300,000 to do a retrofit. And all that pays back in less than two years. So it kind of gives you an idea of the scale of what could be achieved from an impact standpoint um, if someone adopted that type of technology. And we've had to go through all kinds of different test procedures and um, really look at M&V or measurement and verification to have clients understand what these differentials are. Because the first thing they ask you is, well, show me. How, does that, you know, how do you quantify that? And if you can measure it in watts, and you can look at differentiators, and you can use someone like you know, the Powertron technology to, to really go and get to a whole other level of energy savings, you can show them in black and white and monetize that. Yeah. And I think this is a great, uh, a great synopsis. I will let Charles talk about that. Sure. Uh, what you're looking at here is just uh, an example of the power of the, you know, the, the technologies that are out there. 
um, you know, it's not just one single solution. It's the old one plus one is three type of uh, situation where you, know, you have your baseline and, and part of the, well, one of the biggest challenges that we have in applying these is uh, getting a good baseline and, and having all the parties involved that are going to be making the decisions, uh, agreeing to, okay, this is where our existing uh, consumption is today. Our goal is to get it to, you know, something much lower in the future. And, uh, and, and how do we get there? So you see this baseline start, and then we apply the various technologies uh, over a time period, and you see the nice drop. But um, you know, to go back to the previous slide just briefly, I think a, a key to this is not only are these hidden opportunities that aren't being addressed today uh, that are tremendously more energy efficient, so we're doing the right thing, we're driving the uh, demand reduction and the KW reduction at the utility level, but we're also making the built environment more comfortable. And over 10 years of history in this industry, uh, that is much more motivating uh, for, for folks than just a simple financial number. I mean, a lot of people can uh, sort of manipulate numbers and, and push the, the digits around, but when you walk into a building that's well ventilated versus one that has stagnant air and it's uncomfortable temperatures and humidity, uh, most folks will say, spend whatever it takes to make my building this way. Right. And, and all these technologies have those advantages. Um, but, you know, to back to Harry's point, they get left on the cutting room floor because of this, you know, bid process that were uh, all the, the fancy features and the comforts uh, sort of aspects to these get trimmed away through the various processes and parties involved <coughs> in building a new building. So there's just briefly two, two aspects to that. One is how do we get the existing built environment to the most efficient and comfortable level, but also how do we prevent this problem 20 years from now? Mm -hmm. And how do we, when our fellow architects spec these things, keep those features in the process? And I think that's all part of the financial incentive. Okay, well, let's, I want to segue right to the money piece because that's what we're talking about here. Harry made the point, John, you right now. And one of the things that we're about here at AREI is, is supporting startups uh, to be successful financially when they can um, ultimately reduce massive amounts of carbon, okay? So I know that um, Jean has been working very hard uh, on getting his company out there. Now I want to talk about how much money are we really talking about here, Jean, when we go in and say, well, we can go to, say, uh, Citigroup and retrofit all of your uh, buildings in uh, New York City and Chicago just replacing the... Uh, the, car, the, the, the steel blades with carbon blades. I mean, what does that really mean to the people that own these buildings? Sure. I mean, look, um, there's obviously different verticals that you have opportunities to go and retrofit, like you see the slide here. You're looking at commercial refrigeration, you're looking at rooftop units, and then what's called VAV or fan pipe boxes, where you have motors driving air into, into, into space. Well, what's that translated to dollars? So someone like, a, you know, like a, a Morgan Stanley has got 600 buildings, and they're going to do a million dollars a building. So you're looking at a $600 million dollar retrofit, and uh, something like that can pay back in less than two years. Pay back $600 million. Yep. And then after that, it's just, you're just receiving the savings? Correct. So yeah, you think so it's, it's a no-brainer. 50 to 100% return on your money annually. And, so we're talking about a massive investment opportunity here absolutely in, in retrofitting the built environment yep. where people are just going to make tons of money hand over fist. And the hurdle has, has always been, well, show me. You know? So we go and do all these test procedures. You get a floor. You get three floors. You get an entire building. You meter <laughs> everything. You, know, you bring in other technologies like Powertron, and you make it to the point where you know, it's, it's just a, a no-brainer, really. Okay. Uh, you still, up, you still c come across some resistance because it's disruptive technology, as you guys are talking about. You're taking a part out that works perfectly fine and putting in a, a new part that's more energy efficient. But if we can quantify what those differentials are and you can monetize it, then it becomes a financial decision. Right. And, then, and then the money follows it. So you have to be able to, number one, produce. You have to be able to measure and verify it. Uh, revenue grade measurement right. and verification so that the financial institutions can come behind it. And that's what we're starting to see now. Both yep. of our companies are, come up, uh, companies are putting up large uh, sums of money to, to fund our programs for our customers. Uh, so that, that's really what's exciting now. So then you take the risk out, out of the equation for the client or the customer and, and you've got a financing vehicle that can come in and, uh, and do so that. So what's the investment opportunity? Well, it's, no, it's a multi-billion dollar investment opportunity. I mean, if people are looking to put their money into places that, you know, they do well by doing good, that's what we're talking about right. here, right? And, you know, the stock market's producing, what, you know, 8% if you're lucky? I mean, right. you know, so um, 
you know, there are some pretty massive opportunities. There's big return opportunities for sure and big investment opportunities as we grow into spaces like this that haven't been really sort of dealt with or identified before or measured. And that's the key, is it's to measure it and say, well, what's my return? I mean, look, people have built big companies, big lighting companies and, and uh, big solar companies, but the return on investment on this is, is way quicker. So to quote my uh, colleague Amory Lovins, there's yeah. more money to be made in saving energy than there is in producing it. Right. Absolutely. 100% right. More money to be made. And right. we, we okay, so if anybody's interested in the FridgeWise um, you know, model, please see John uh, afterwards. Um, I think at this point I'd really like to engage uh, the audience with some questions and get, get this conversation going uh, off the stage. So do we have anybody out there that really is burning with desire to figure it out on the built environment? This, uh, this woman in yellow, I guess, first. A question one, quickly, please. Yeah, one of the, the problems we've had in Florida is identifying companies who would be interested in this who not only own their own building, but they pay their own utility bills. So how have you navigated that? What are the best prospects? I'm assuming Morgan Stanley owns the building mm -hmm. and pays the utility bill, and obviously has taxable income. But how do you navigate that? Well, it is a constant problem to have the, out, the owner of a building, uh, when you can bring a technology, the owner gets part of the benefit, that being some piece of equipment, and then the tenant pays the power bill. So uh, the way that you do that is you have to get permission from the owner to do the retrofit, and mostly you have to convince the tenant um, to, to fund the project. So therefore, you have to justify with, with electricity savings. That's the best way to do it. Right. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and that's over. Uh, the gentleman here in the blue shirt. Paul Hawkins is and team is telling us that refrigeration management is the number one solution to drawing carbon out of the atmosphere if we'll take care of that properly. I love the idea of the built environment, reducing our need for refrigerant, all the different things that you're talking about. In particular, I'm wondering if the Powertron solution is actually going to reduce the requirement that we, that we recycle HFCs or the equivalent in the future because as I, read, as I read online what it is that you're doing, it looks like it actually increases the efficiency of whatever the refrigerant product is that you're using. It is. It's about a thermal uh, exchange process. So our nanotechnology is called permafrost. Uh, it, it is made to make metals transfer heat at a faster rate. And when you can move that thermal energy uh, through the process quicker, you effectively need less uh, HFCs. And, and if I could read a, a quick, I had a, a, my CTO send us a, a, send me a quick um, thing that just came out this morning. And it's basically that by 2050, the number of, the amount of HVAC on the planet is projected to triple uh, as a result of dealing with rising temperatures and you have to do it. And it says basically growing electricity demand for all air conditioning is one of the most critical blind spots in today's energy debate. And so along those lines, um, HVAC, uh, the containment of it, the building process, the retrofitting, the going forward, m making sure that it runs efficiently is probably one of the most single, uh, most important issues in the built environment. Sure. I want to thank my esteemed panel, and uh, since we're out of time, um, I thank you gentlemen for all your good work, and um, let's go out and rebuild our world. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.